um, curate those for you. Um, if there's kind of a natural switching of gears at some point in your talk and you'd wanna address questions that may have accumulated, um, you might wanna pause and we can do that or we can save them for the end. Um, it's really up to you. Um, and this talk is being live streamed. Um, so if you don't wanna be recorded, uh, now's the time to turn off uh, your camera. Uh, so those are my, my announcements and I'll just hand it over to Eve uh, to introduce today's speaker. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Uh, we're very pleased to have Diana Powell, who is a graduating student, a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, working with C. Zhang and Ruth Murray Clay. She is a rising star in the field of plant information, having been offered pretty much all major national and institutional postdoctoral fellowships this year. And she's also been awarded countless awards during her um, academic career so far, including the Ford Foundation Dissertation Fellowship. Diana is an expert in theories of protoplanetary disks and exoplanetary atmospheres with a particular focus on their chemistry and microphysics. And she will be moving on as a Hubble Plus ITC fellow at the CFA next year. And I'm very much looking forward to learning more about her work. So without further ado, please take it away. Awesome, thank you, Eve. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Diana Powell and I'm finishing my PhD at UC Santa Cruz. And today I'm really excited to talk with you all about protoplanetary disks and substellar atmospheres. And in particular, I'll be focusing on insights that we can gain from understanding these objects from the perspective of microphysics. And so for the purposes of this talk, uh, microphysics refers to the physics governing the evolution of small particles in the presence of gas. And so the key question behind all of my research is what is the origin, evolution, and nature of planets? And to address this question, I characterize planets in the planetary material and protoplanetary disks. And in particular, I use theoretical microphysical tools to be peer beneath the veil of each stage of planet formation to uncover fundamental properties of both disks and atmospheres. And so the picture of planet formation that has emerged looks more or less like this. So planets form in protoplanetary disks, either from the accretion of solids and gas or the gravitational collapse of material. So these disks really constitute the building blocks of planetary systems. Then once the protoplanetary disk dissipates, a young planetary system remains. And if there are gas giants present, they're initially relatively hot. And so this phase, the second phase here is not usually included in diagrams like this, but I'm doing so here because it really represents a distinct observational stage with unique signatures and observing strategies. And then as time progresses, the planetary system will evolve Many of the gas giant planets will, if they're present, will cool. Um, planets will find relatively stable orbits and the planetary atmospheres will evolve. Okay, so this is the general picture. But what I really wanna know is how can we relate these disparate evolutionary stages to learn more about the formation, evolution, and nature of the full complement of planetary systems. And we're all really lucky to be alive at a time where we can observe each of these stages of planetary evolution. So all of them are going, undergoing this observational revolution where we have these unprecedented observations. So we can observe protoplanetary disks, um, such as the disks observed in high resolution shown here. And then as a bonus kind of stage, we can observe disks undergoing active planet formation, like the PDS-70 system shown here, where you can see two points that are thought to be giant planets undergoing accretion. And then we can also observe young planetary systems directly, like the beta pick system shown in the bottom left. And finally, we now have observations of over 4,000 evolved exoplanets. And so with all of this data, this is really the era to start actively connecting planet formation and planetary characterization. And so in particular, a promising avenue forward is to connect some of the properties of protoplanetary disks to the properties of exoplanet atmospheres. But even though we have this opportunity, there are still several challenges in making this connection. And that's because uh, we really have to think about what we're actually looking at when we're observing each of these objects. So when we look at observations of protoplanetary disks, we are looking at small dust grains and some different trace gas species. And many of these recent observations are really spectacularly radially resolved, but they're often limited due to a lack of probes of the primary disk properties, such as the total mass in the system, and then some of the important but detailed properties of the solid and gaseous mass constituents. And this is all particularly true in the planet forming regions of the disk. And then when we look at detailed observations of young and evolved planetary systems, 
um, when we're looking to characterize these objects, we're often looking at their atmospheres. And similarly, these observations are often hindered by opacity sources, such as clouds and hazes that can obscure planetary properties. And so to make the connection between protoplanetary disks and planetary atmospheres, we really need better physical models to interpret current and upcoming observations. And I'll argue in this talk that microphysics will be um, important in making this connection, and it may well be key to understanding the evolution, origin, and nature of planets. And so I'll start by talking about substellar atmospheres with a focus on clouds, and I will then move on to discussing protoplanetary disks and the total amount of mass present in these systems. And finally, I'll bring these two topics together through a discussion of the evolution of carbon monoxide and disks. Okay, so let's talk about clouds. So we all have some intuition about clouds from our familiarity with clouds on Earth. But clouds are important beyond Earth and are in fact the dominant opacity source in most planetary atmospheres. So clouds are important tracers of atmospheric physics, such as mixing and transport. Clouds regulate the planetary climate through regulating radiative transfer and chemistry. And clouds must be understood when determining atmospheric abundances. Also, often the clouds in an atmosphere are the only thing that we can see. So it's therefore an absolute necessity that we understand clouds when we are interpreting planetary atmospheres. And clouds appear to be abundant in substellar atmospheres. So here on the left, I'm showing a collection of transmission spectra of 10 hot Jupiters, where some of these atmospheres have damp spectral features and flattened or sloped optical spectra. And all of this is indicative of some optically thick absorber of stellar photons like clouds. And clouds may also have been observed directly in the atmospheres of brown dwarfs. Um, so brown dwarfs have similar atmospheric properties to some giant planets. And in the middle here, I'm showing emission spectra of two brown dwarfs with these broad absorption features in the infrared that are not quite captured by the models shown here. And these are thought to be caused by silicate clouds in their atmospheres. And clouds are also thought to contribute to observed spectral variability. So on the right here, I'm showing emission spectra of the same brown dwarf at two different times where you can see that the amplitude of the spectra can vary significantly. So clouds often dramatically impact observations of substellar atmospheres. And this presents a really exciting opportunity. So with the understanding of clouds, we can explain current observations, we can probe fundamental planetary properties, and we can predict future observational signatures. So let's start by understanding clouds. So I like to think of three key microphysical processes of cloud formation. And all of these processes depend on atmospheric conditions, as well as other key properties. And so the first process is nucleation, which occurs when a supersaturated background gas nucleates onto a C particle. And there can also be homogeneous nucleation where a gas nucleates without the presence of a seed. And then whether a species nucleates homogeneously, heterogeneously, or not at all, depends a lot on the species specific material properties. Then condensation occurs when a condensable molecule diffuses along a path and interacts with the cloud particle and condensational growth occurs. And this process is often limited by diffusion. And then clouds can also grow via coagulation where two particles collide forming either a larger spherical particle or an aggregate. And this process is often limited in my simulations by the particle number density. And so I approach the study of clouds using these microphysical processes with the community aerosol and radiation model for atmospheres known as KARMA. So KARMA is a well-tested code that has been applied to nearly every planetary body in our solar system with an appreciable atmosphere. Karma works on this Eulerian grid of particle size and altitude, where particles are allowed to grow and move into larger bins or evaporate and move to smaller bins, and they can also move vertically along this grid. And I'll show why karma is particularly powerful, um, but I'll, I'll give it away right now and say that's because it calculates these fully resolved cloud particle size distributions from first principles in a time-dependent framework. And so on the right is a general picture of how karma operates. So here I'm showing altitude in the atmosphere as well as temperature and pressure. And in a typical setup, condensable gases are mixed upwards from a reservoir in the deep atmosphere until they reach a point where the gas becomes supersaturated and cloud particles form via microphysical processes. 
these particles can then themselves be vertically mixed or settle gravitationally. And so here's a primer of the results that I calculate with KARMA. So here I'm plotting the mass density of condensed cloud particles as a function of particle size and atmospheric pressure. And here each of the different colors indicates a different cloud species. And so as you can see, each cloud species forms at different times and has different particle sizes and vertical extents. And my results also tend to reach a steady state as there's some variability, which might be real, like the climate cycles that we have on Earth or Venus. But for the remainder of this talk, I'll be showing time average solutions. And so with these results, we can answer key questions, such as the impact of the cloud particle size distribution on the observed spectra. So on the top right here in black, I'm showing a model transmission spectra for hot Jupiter with our fully resolved cloud particle size distribution. And then on the same plot in blue, I'm showing the transmission spectra if we take an average cloud particle size for each cloud species and conserve the total cloud mass. So as you can see, both the amplitude and the shape of the transmission spectra changes between these two cases. And this is particularly dramatic um, near the, the broad cloud absorption features in the infrared and in the optical. And so this indicates that understanding the cloud particle size distribution is important when interpreting observed spectra. And then because this framework also considers barriers to cloud formation, we can also predict that which cloud species dominates the observed spectra. So on the bottom right here in black, I'm showing a different model transmission spectra for a different hot Jupiter, where we include the opacity from all the cloud species that form. And then in gray, I'm showing the model transmission spectra for a hot Jupiter where we include no cloud opacities. So you can already see how much of a difference clouds make on the spectra. And then in different colors, I'm showing what the, the spectra would look like if we only include the opacity from a particular cloud species. And so in this case, silicate clouds dominate the cloud opacity and shape the spectra across a broad wavelength range. And in addition to impacting spectra, Clouds may also serve as probes of planetary properties, such as their interior thermal structure. So here I'm showing emission opacities as a function of wavelength and atmospheric pressure for a planet with the same upper atmosphere thermal structure, but different internal thermal structures. And here the dotted white line indicates the location where the clouds become opaque. So for the high entropy planet with a hotter interior, clouds are opaque as high as 0.1 bar, but then a cooler planet with a lower entropy interior clouds only become opaque at around 10 bar, so much deeper in the atmosphere. So clouds may thus be able to serve as probes of planetary interiors as they are sensitive to these planetary properties across different scales. And so something that's, that's really powerful about this framework for microphysical clouds is that we can directly calculate the time scale of each cloud formation process. And we can see how this in turn feeds back into large scale time scales like uh, thermo hydrodynamic uh, transport time scales and atmospheres. So there's a lot of information in this plot, but right now I wanna draw your attention to the evaporation time scale in particular. And I just want you to notice that evaporation is very fast when thermodynamically favorable. Okay, so with this in mind, now let's talk about predictions for future observational signatures. And in particular, I wanna discuss the case of inhomogeneous clouds on hot Jupiters. So hot Jupiters are tidally locked, such that they have permanent day sides and this extreme insulation gradient. And this insulation gradient will often drive a super rotating equatorial jet that operates to reduce the gradient in insulation, but it does so less efficiently at hotter temperatures where re-radiation dominates. And so these planets thus tend to have very hot day sides, a hot eastern limb, relatively cool night sides, and then a cool west limb. And so when I think of these planets, I'm really excited by them because they have these atmospheric inhomogeneities that lead the, and also really high temperatures that make them really exciting laboratories for understanding cloud physics. So we think that lots of different cloud species should form. Okay, so let's consider the particular case where the day side is too hot to form clouds. And remember that we saw that evaporation is fast. So if there's no, if clouds can't form on the day side or survive on the day side, then there'll be no direct transport between the cooler west limb and the hotter east limb if, if the atmospheric flow is along the super rotating equatorial jet. So in this case, we would expect from equilibrium thermodynamic arguments that the clouds on each limb would have different uh, compositions and form at different heights in the atmosphere. 
And that's what I'm showing here on the right, where I'm plotting the pressure temperature profiles on the cooler west limb and the hotter east limb. But what do we find when we model these clouds using microphysics? So here I'm showing cloud particle mass densities as a function of particle radius and atmospheric pressure, where each color represents a different cloud species. So on the hotter east limb, clouds form higher in the atmosphere and grow to relatively small sizes, while on the cooler west limb, more cloud species form and they do so deeper in the atmosphere and they grow to relatively large sizes. And then the polar regions are some intermediate between these two. And if we compare these results to expectations from equilibrium modeling, we find that several species that we expected would form are not actually able to abundantly form given these atmospheric conditions. And we can then translate these cloud properties into transmission spectra. And so we've done so here, and we predict that there should be the significant difference in both amplitude and shape between the east and west limbs of the same hot Jupiter. So in black, I'm showing the calculated transmission spectra on the east and west limbs. And then in gray, I'm showing the east limb cloud-free transmission spectra. And then in blue, I'm showing the opacity continuum due to clouds. So on the west limb, cloud opacity is significant across a broad wavelength range where it flattens the observed transmission spectra. But then on the east limb, the clouds contribute to a muted and sloped optical spectra, and then this broad absorption feature in the infrared, in this case due to silicate and aluminum clouds. And then there's also this intriguing clear window around 3 to 10 microns that could allow us to peer through the clouds. And this difference in transmission spectra corresponds to an observable difference in limb radii as viewed in transmission. So here I'm showing two scale limb radii differences in the case of clouds on the top and for a cloud-free atmosphere on the bottom. So the cloudy atmosphere has distinctly asymmetrical limb radii that is significantly more inhomogeneous than the clear atmosphere case, which also has some subtle asymmetry here, but that's just due to temperature differences alone. So clouds exaggerate how inhomogeneous an atmosphere appears. And so if we try to fit this inhomogeneous atmosphere using a homogeneous atmosphere model, we end up with residuals as shown here on the left, which to those of you familiar with transits, uh, we'll, we'll see that these residuals to first order look like what we would expect to see if the transit timing was not known well enough. So if we were having a slightly early or late transit. But luckily for us, these residuals are chromatic and change in wavelength in a way that is characteristic of the presence of clouds. And we've shown that with James Webb, we should be able to detect atmospheric inhomogeneity due to clouds with observations of just two transits. So here on the right, I'm showing how asymmetrical an atmosphere appears to be as a function of equilibrium temperature for both the cloudy and clear atmosphere cases. And then how well we can detect this asymmetry is shown in blue, where darker blue is a better detection. And so you can see that the hotter planets in our sample have a significant detection of atmosphere asymmetry that is always stronger in the cloudy case and can be robustly detected with James Webb. And I'm also working on interpreting observations of exoplanets um, from several viewing angles, so an emission, reflection, and transmission using two-dimensional models of microphysical clouds, where we calculate how cloud properties change as clouds are affected along the super rotating equatorial jet of a hot Jupiter. So here I'm showing condensed cloud mass of different species as a function of planetary longitude and pressure. And using these models, we can robustly determine the impact of clouds on high resolution observations and exoplanet phase curves. And so I'm not going to talk about this particular slide in detail, but I just wanna quickly point out that we've applied this modeling to very low gravity brown dwarfs, which have an abundance of data. And, um, and so here I'm showing this color magnitude diagram for brown dwarfs. And then in yellow, I'm highlighting this very low gravity sequence, so relatively newly discovered. And if we were to model these objects with clear atmospheres and no clouds, the points would lie in this region of the diagram, where we do not really observe any brown dwarfs. And then if we model clouds in these atmospheres without microphysics, then the points lie here. So they're much redder, although they start to become more clear at lower equilibrium temperatures. And then when we instead consider microphysical clouds, those points lie here, so the same ones, just shifted over. And we can see a distinct shift towards the red, particularly for the cooler objects. And something that's particularly encouraging about these microphysical results is that the points really follow the straight slope of the sequence down to the reddest regions where we're currently discovering objects. And they don't curve off to the blue, 
So these re results really demonstrate that resolving the size distribution using microphysical clouds can naturally reproduce this very low gravity sequence of brown dwarfs. And so I discussed the importance of understanding clouds in substellar atmospheres, which is important in constraining evolved planets. And now I'm about to turn our attention to protoplanetary disks, so these locations of planet formation. And I'll, I'll start by talking about the interesting question of how much total mass is present in the system. But if there are any questions uh, on clouds right now, it would be a good time. Yeah, so it looks like we've got one from Nick. Nick, do you want to unmute and ask? Yeah, sure. So when you're using the color coding to keep track of different cloud species, um, mm -hmm. what does it mean? What, like, what does a species of a cloud mean if I have like something condensing onto a nucleus possibly made out of a different condensed gas? Yeah, so what I think of in a very practical sense, a, a cloud species would just look like that cloud. Um, so it would have enough of silicate or something to look like silicate when you observe it. The way that it works in our models, though, is that we allow clouds to interact to a certain extent, so they can form on top of one cloud. But once they do that, then the only thing we allow to continue to condense is the same cloud species. You can imagine a dirty cloud, um, and then you could even start thinking about how clouds appear in the solar system, and then things become uh, even more unsettling, like uh, like ammonia clouds in Jupiter. They look like ammonia until they get uh, polluted with these like interesting, colorful things that make them no longer look like ammonia clouds, but you see them like ammonia for a little bit. Um, so. It's, it's worth thinking about, but that's what I mean. Different different species that you observe as different species. So it looks like iron when you look at it in a spectra. Got it, that makes sense, thanks. <laughs> okay, all right, so mass in disks. So the most common tracers of protoplanetary disk properties are dust or different trace gases, such as CO gas. And that's because these are relatively easy to observe. Due to, and due to a lack of the direct probes of the main mass constituent, which is H2 gas, these previous measures of disk mass have relied on some tracer to H2 ratio, so either dust to gas or CO to H2. But we know that processes such as grain growth and drift should alter the dust to gas ratio from the typically assumed interstellar medium value. And now several lines of evidence also suggest that gas-based CO, particularly in the commonly observed upper disk layers, is depleted in disks. And so this all begs the questions, how can we measure the total mass without an assumed tracer to H2 ratio? And also what is happening to all of the CO? And so I began addressing these questions by considering recent multi-wavelength observations of disks in the millimeter. So here I'm showing a visualization of observations of the disk TW Hydra. And here these are all images of the same disk, but it appears smaller in radius at longer wavelengths. And to introduce some terminology, I refer to the maximum radius in which there is a mission at a particular wavelength as a dust line. And as others have suggested, these observations may be signatures of particle drift. And I'll take a step back for a moment to talk about the two main processes that can limit particle growth in disks. And here I'm showcasing work done by my undergraduate student, Elizabeth Yennerman, who will be starting graduate school in the fall. So in the shaded regions of phase space that I'm showing here, particles are unlikely to reside due to barriers to their continued growth. So the process that's the most important in the inner disk is fragmentation, which depends sensitively on the assumed particle material properties. So fragmentation may be significant for a range of particle sizes throughout the disk, or may only be relevant for a narrow range of particles in only the innermost disk regions. Then in the outer disk, particle growth is often limited by drift. And as I'm interested in the dust lines in the outer disk, let's talk about drift in more detail. So particles drift in disks because the gas feels an outward pressure gradient that causes particles to feel a drag that removes some of their angular momentum and causes them to drift inwards towards their host star. And so I'll take a little bit of time walking through this time scale since it will lead to the key equation for this portion of the talk. So the drift time scale of a particle is given by its orbital distance divided by the velocity difference between the gas velocity and the Keplerian velocity. And then there's the stopping time parameter tau s, and that's because particles are neither quite at the gas speed nor at the Keplerian speed. And so we observe small particles that are relatively well coupled with stopping times less than one. And in this regime, larger particles with larger stopping times drift faster. And so we can write the stopping times and stopping time in terms of standard disk parameters and then rewrite the drift time scale. 
And so here, this time scale is ex exactly the same as what I've written above, and it's just rewritten in terms of the total gaseous surface density, sigma g. And you can understand why this time scale depends on the gas surface density, because if you have more gas, then you'll also have more gas drag, and that will change the stopping time for a particle of a fixed size. And if we re rearrange this equation like this, we see that we can derive the total disk surface density as a function of radius if we know the rest of these quantities. So in particular, if we know the maximum radius in which particles of a given size are present. And here, just notice quickly that for a fixed particle size and fixed radius, a larger surface density means that you have a longer drift time scale just because you're better coupled to the gas. So if we have some knowledge beforehand of what the particle's drift time scale is, we can use this method to derive the total disk mass. And to motivate my choice for drift time scale, here I'm showing a dust evolution simulation that shows the surface density in solids as a function of particle size and radius in the disk. And in particular, I want you to focus on the dashed red line indicating the maximum size that a particle can grow to before it drifts inwards. So as you can see in the outer disk at late times, particle growth is limited by drift and collisional destruction becomes less important. So that's the black dash line. And so the maximum particle size at a given radius is therefore set by particles whose growth time scale equals their drift time scale. So particles that have grown up to the maximum size that they can before drifting inwards at a given time. And if you look at a particular distance, the particle size is reduced over time as these larger particles drift inwards. So we can therefore expect that the largest particle size at a given radius is the particle with a drift time scale that's comparable to its growth time scales and the current age of the system. Okay, so now we know something about these particles drift time scales. So it uh, should be roughly comparable to the age of the system if they're the maximum particle size at that location. And then we won't use this right now, but I wanna point out to you that the dust to gas ratio is also decreasing with time. Okay, so now that we've assumed that the drift time scale of particles is roughly the age of the system, we can determine the surface density at a given radius if we know the maximum particle size at that location. And so we can infer the particle size if the observed wavelength corresponds to the primary particle size contributing to the observed emission at the disk outer edge. And we can measure the disk size to determine the radius in which these particles are the maximally sized grains. And this method allows us to derive the disk surface density without assuming a tracer to H2 ratio. And that's because we only care about how fast the particles drift, which depends on their size and not how many particles are present. And so on the right here is a quick visual summary of this new picture of protoplanetary disks. So large particles of size S1 are present throughout the disk until they reach a radius where their drift time scale is comparable to their growth and time scale and the age of the system. And if you were to look at this disk at an observing wavelength approximately equal to S1, you will see a disk with this radial extent. And then the same is true for smaller particles of size S2 that extend throughout the disk until they reach a radius where their time scales are equal. And again, for even smaller particles of size S3, where if you were to look at this disk at a shorting, shorter wavelength comparable to size S3, you would see a much more radially extended system. So I've applied this model to seven protoplanetary disks with previous millimeter observations that show decreasing disk radial extent with wavelength. And so here I'm showing some of these observations for three out of the seven disks in our sample. And as a technical aside, this is how we're actually measuring the disk outer edge, which is an important measurement as it's one of the fundamental quantities in our modeling. So that's the maximum radius in which particles of a given size are present. So we developed an MCMC method for finding the disk outer edge through modeling the disk interferometric visibilities using a NUCRA profile. And so on the left here, I'm showing a sample set of modeled visibilities. And on the right, I'm showing a model surface brightness profile. And you can see here in blue that our method for finding the true disk outer edge is robust, even in the presence of these brightness dips caused by substructure. Okay, so here I'm showing total gaseous surface densities for the disks in our sample. So the black points are the surface densities derived from dust lines, and the red or blue lines are previously published surface density profiles derived either from CO emission or combined multi-wavelength observations of dust. And what we've done here is just renormalize these previous profiles so as to match the dust line derived to surface densities. 
And if we had many more points from dust lines, we could just directly fit the profile shapes as I've done in the dashed black line in the bottom right here for the just around DUAR25. But right now we can match previous profiles quite well. And, and notice that these profiles do not all have the same slopes and the dust line drag points are not all straight lines and instead follow the curves of these profiles. And this really did not have to be the case. So for example, FT Tau and DW Hydra have different profile shapes, but for both the dust line points match the previously published profiles. And if you remember, we showed that the substructure, does, substructure in disks does not affect these results, except I'll tell you that there's one exception to this, and that's if you have some kind of substructure like a ring or pressure trap that is the very outermost thing in your disk. And then what we would expect to have happen in a ring like that is that all of the different sizes would end up at the same location. So we can look and see if there's a disk that looks like this. And in the interest of time, I'll just spoil it and say it's AS209 in the bottom left, where the furthest out point does not match the, the renormalized surface density profile. But if we look at these two furthest out points representing different particle sizes, they're at the same location and that is exactly what's going on here. So there's a ring in the outermost region of the disk. And so in this case, it doesn't just give you random sizes at random radii, they're the same radius, so they'll be at the ring location. So if there's an outermost substructure, um, you'll get a bunch of sizes at the same radius. And then otherwise, as we showed before, our results do not depend on substructure. So all of this is what makes me encourage that this model is doing well. And so we can now place these dust line derived masses in context. So here on the left, I'm showing total gaseous surface densities in black um, derived using our dust line model compared to previous tracer derived surface densities and the minimum mass solar nebula. So the disks in our sample are nine to 27% of their host stellar masses, which is significantly more massive than the minimum mass solar nebula. These disks are also two to 15 times more massive than estimates from optically thin dust emission, assuming an, an interstellar medium dust to gas ratio. And for the three disks in our sample with resolved CO emission, our estimates are 3, 40, and 115 times more massive than previously published, indicating that CO depletion is not uniform across different disks. And so these results indicate that dust is a more robust tracer of total mass because we uncover a reduced gas to dust ratio that is roughly consistent across our sample, while the CO to H2 ratio varies more strongly. And I'll come back to this later in the talk. Okay, so here I'm plotting the tumor Q stability parameter as a function of radius in the outer disk for the disks in our sample. So as you know, a tumor Q parameter less than about one is where you would start gravitationally collapsing under your own self-gravity. And so all of the disks in our sample are stable to gravitational collapse, except for one disk, which approaches the limit of tumor Q stability. And it does so in a region where there may be signatures and high resolution observations that it does have um, some amount of gravitational instability. But I do wanna note that all of the disks in our sample have these low Q values at certain radii. And so we think that when you form disks, they're accreting efficiently because they're marginally unstable. And this marginal instability might help raise spiral arms that throw material onto the star. And so we still think that all of that is going on. After this early phase of star formation, you really need MRI or disk winds to kick in to drive further accretion. And it's still a big mystery how disks are able to accrete efficiently at late times. But maybe if some disks are actually close to gravitational instability, then you do not need a lot of these accretion processes to be happening because at least some disks, so I guess particularly the bright massive disks in my sample, seem to maintain much of their mass. And so in our modeling thus far, it has not been required to know an expected dust surface density. But given our results, we can now use models of coagulation to compute the dust surface densities since we know that this maximally sized particle at a given location also has a growth time scale that's comparable to the age of the system. So here I'm showing surface densities for the disk FT tau, where the blue line is the total gaseous surface density derived using our dust line method. And then the solid black line is the observed dust surface density. And here the dashed lines are dust surface densities derived using analytic and numerical treatments of particle coagulation. Okay, so for the disks in our sample, we derived depleted dust to gas ratios of around 10 to the minus three in the outer disk, which is a common outcome of models of grain growth and drift. Then the obvious question is where did all the dust go? And so in these models, it went into the inner disk where it further evolved. 
And then it's worth noting that in these models, the disks formed with an initial dust mass that is a factor of 10 greater than is presently observed. And being able to constrain the dust and gaseous surface densities using this method can allow us to empirically constrain the dust opacity, which is particularly exciting because the dust opacity remains one of the largest sources of uncertainties in studies of protoplanetary disks. Okay, so here is this new picture of disks where they may be more massive than previously appreciated. So the total dust mass is the same, but the total gas mass is an order of magnitude larger. And these qualitative changes to models of protoplanetary disks have significant implications for theories of planet formation. And this is all particularly true for any process where the amount of gas affects the evolution of solids. So that will be affected by this picture. And I also wanna emphasize that our model indicates that there is more dust mass at early times, which helps bring agreement between the discrepancy in disk dust masses, which appears small compared to the mass of extrasolar systems. Okay. And so we've discussed the total mass in disks, but, but really what is happening to all the CO gas in these systems? And I really wanna know the answer to this question because CO has been used as a tracer for a broad range of fundamental disk properties. And to answer this question, I'll combine the two methods that I've used so far in this talk. So modeling clouds and modeling disks. But I guess this is a good point for questions if there are any for uh, dust lines. I don't see it in the chat, but oh, it looks like Eve has a question. Go ahead, Eve. Um, I, uh, so I have a question about the, um, the dust opacity. So you've mentioned that that mm -hmm. is like one of the most uh, uncertain parameters in the modeling of the protoplanetary disk. And you mentioned how you can use your model to empirically determine the dust opacity. But um, when you made the assumption that when when you see this um, size wavelength dependence, you have made the assumption that the wavelength that you observe um, is basically the maximal size of the grains. Aren't you already making some assumption about the dust opacity there? Yes, yeah, so we do make an assumption. It actually boils down a bit about the opacity, but in particular, it shows up in the size distribution that the dust can have. Um, then that'll shape its optical properties. And yeah. so I'm currently working on a project now with Till Bernsteel where we're seeing we're seeing what we can say about the dust opacity for this empirical fact to be true. So the disk appears smaller at different wavelengths. And there's actually a lot you can constrain about what opacities look like in these systems. So there's an, an absolute dust opacity, but then you can also constrain how porous the grains can be. So if they're super porous, it totally washes out the signal you expect to see. Uh, they kind of, it kind of behaves like you have a lot of large particles. I think I have that right. It behaves like you have lots of particles of one size. Um, so there, so we do assume, well, what it means actually about the, the systems based off of how we can see these dust lines is that there's a, a range of potential uh, dust size distributions. So there has to be most of your mass in large sizes, most of your number in small sizes, and they can't be too porous. Um, so they can have like a filling factor of uh, up to about five before you lose signals of, of dust lines. Okay. But it's true. So this is without, so there's some assumptions that go in or that have to be true really for us to observe what we see in these systems. Okay. We've got a couple more. Um, so Nick had his hand up first. So Nick, you can go ahead and unmute and then we'll come back to Daniel. Yeah, so I've, I've got sort of a naive question. If, if the, you said that the dust mass is the same as what people thought before, but the gas mass is much higher. Um, what fraction of your metals are in dust? And do you start running into some problem where the inferred metallicities are crazy. Oh, interesting. In the in the resulting plan, so I don't have a great answer for you right now in terms of the metallicities that you'll assume for the planets. But it certainly, um, I, I've thought about this more in the context of carbon enrichment, which I'll talk about in the next part of the. But I I'm, I'm still early stages of how this would change what you'd expect a planet to look like. Um, but you do run into right now if you look at observed dust masses and exoplanet systems, there, there's not enough dust to, to make the exoplanetary systems that we see. So what, what's nice about this is that we observed the, the dust that we observe, it's, it's about what we thought it was, but there was a lot more at early times that it has since evolved. Um, it's either sitting around in the inner disk or, or further evolved from there. Okay, Daniel, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, so it's sort, sort of a basic question, but I'm just trying to make sure I, I'm understanding. So, so the limit set, on uh, particle size that, that decreases with the radius in the disk. That's not really because of any drift properties, that's just because they're 
forming slower in the outer disk. And so the balance is different, is that right? So the, the relative velocities of the outer disk are just smaller. So, so it does take long, the time scales are longer in the outer disk. So it takes longer to grow up to some size where you expect to drift. Uh, but then you drift instead of fragmenting because you don't have the same, same velocities as you do in the inner disk. Um, um, okay, delta V things. Good, thank you. Okay, maybe one last question for now from Mohammed. Go ahead and unmute. Uh, hi, Diana. Sorry, I actually have uh, two questions. The first is in your fragmentation model for disks, do you account for both drift induced fragmentation and turbulent fragmentation? And if so, what do you assume for the, uh, for the turbulence? And the second is when you calculated the Tumri parameter, what did you assume for temperature? Because stable disks that are 25% of the st stellar mass, this is very weird. Yeah, absolutely. So for the first one, um, so I so in the dust line modeling, fragmentation uh, doesn't come into my model at all. But when I've looked at it with the undergraduate student who's about to start graduate school, um, we do include fragmentation that could be from drift or from turbulence. And we for the turbulence, we uh, probe a range of different alpha values. So it's so a pretty simplified turbulence, just alpha disk models of, of how turbulence operates. Um, and then for temperatures, we assume that the disk is uh, dominated by passive irradiation. So we take the luminosity of the star and then uh, just work out a really simple passive radiation model um, for the rest of the disk, which actually seems to work quite well for, for some more complicated radio transfer modeling of disk temperatures for these objects. But they do so, yeah, they do get, they do get close to being unstable. So they're, they're in, in a, a relatively unstable regime of the space phase. Okay, thank you. Good, Diana, we're all caught up. Thanks for uh, pausing and you're welcome to continue with the, the last bit of your talk. Okay, awesome, thanks for your questions. All right, so I'll talk a bit more about CO in these systems. And, and I'll start by saying it's not just my modeling that indicates that CO is depleted in disks. So on the left here, I'm showing the CO abundance and the disk TW hydra as a function of radius as compared to the abundance that we would expect from observations of the ISM. And so you can see that CO gas appears to be significantly depleted. And then the same is true if we look at large samples of disks. So here I'm showing an ALMA survey of disks in lupus, where on top the disks span several orders of magnitude in dust mass, but they have fairly constant gas masses as estimated from CO. So in short, we observe much less CO in disks than we would expect, or that would be predicted using previous disk models. And so to address this problem, I've coupled my model for protoplanetary disk properties with an adapted version of the models that I used to study cloud formation in planetary atmospheres. And in this context, I'm modeling the formation of ice on dust and disks. And in particular, the nucleation and growth processes in my scheme for ice formation include the Kelvin effect, which quantifies the stability of particles through considering the strength of the molecular surface bonds. And so I like to think about this effect in terms of geometry, where an ice molecule on the surface of a small grain will not be able to molecularly bond to as many neighbors as it would on a large particle. And so in short, the Kelvin effect causes, causes large particles to nucleate and grow more easily. And the particle sizes are important here because they regulate the level of depletion of gaseous CO. So if we approximate the vertical disk temperature structure as shown here on the left, where vertically the disk is isothermal until it reaches a height where surface layer heating is efficient and temperature increases. And the midplane, the disk is cool enough for ice to form on dust grains. So there'll be a region of the disk where ice is stable and then a region where evaporation or photodesorption could occur. And so if the ice particles that form in the midplane are small, then they can be lofted to the upper regions of the disk and evaporate such that CO gas is not significantly depleted. But on the other hand, if the ice particle is large, it can deplete the CO gas in the midplane. And so that's what I'm showing here on the right. So once the initial abundance of CO gas that's shown in solid black is depleted in the midplane as shown in gray, there will be this concentration gradient vertically that is smoothed by vertical diffusion. And this would ultimately lead to a depletion of CO and observed upper levels as shown in solid red. And so this is the so-called cold finger effect, which can lead to large depletion of CO gas in the upper disk. But the particles and gas in the system evolve radially as well as vertically. So at early times, gas will be depleted faster in the inner disk just exterior to the midplane CO ice line, where vertical gas diffusion is faster. 
And then with time, CO gas is increasingly depleted in the outer disk as diffusion has time to operate. And then in the inner disk interior to the, the mid-plane CO ice line, ice particles will drift inwards until they reach this warm region um, and release their volatile content. And so this causes there to be an increased abundance of CO gas in the inner disk that can be accreted onto the host star. And so stated in a different way, CO gas will be continually mixed down from the upper regions where it will form um, on large particles, form ice on large particles. These particles will drift inward with time until they reach a warmer region of the disk where they release their volatile content and some interesting cycling of material happens around these mid-plane ice lines. Then there'll be an enhanced abundance of CO gas in the inner disk that can be accreted onto the host star with time. And so we find good agreement here between our results and observations, as I'm showing in the small plots, B through E around the larger plot. And in our modeling, we find that this process depends strongly on diffusion, which contributes to this observed variance of CO depletion in different disks. So in the large plot here, you can see that the amount of observed depletion in the outer disk depends on the amount of diffusion that has operated in the lifetime of disks. And I will note that this process is also applicable to other volatiles in disks. And so here really the microphysical processes of ice formation both regulates the observed abundances of CO gas and is crucial on determining the radial composition of protoplanetary disks. So this modeling brings nice agreement and different ways of measuring disk masses from different tracers. It also allows us to better put constraints on the composition of material in the midplane and how that changes with time and allows us to get a handle on the diffusion properties of different systems. And so in conclusion, I've talked about understanding substellar atmospheres using cloud microphysics, and I've discussed uncovering fundamental properties of protoplanetary disks using particle aerodynamics and ice formation. I've shown that clouds are sensitive tracers of planetary properties, that clouds on the limbs of hot Jupiters are inhomogeneous and can be detected with James Webb, that Binsky microphysical clouds really naturally explain the very low gravity sequence of brown dwarfs. And when I say Binsky, I just mean resolved size distributions and that disks may be more massive than previously appreciated, and the microphysics of CO freeze out and particle drift controls the observed CO gas abundance. Thank you so much. All right, thanks very much. Um, and thanks for keeping time. So we have um, time for more questions. I know we've had a lot already, but uh, feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom chat and I'll call on you to unmute or um, add your questions to the chat. Okay, Eve, you're up. Thanks a lot, Diana, for the really great talk. Um, so I just have actually a follow-up question to uh, your answer to Nick's question um, previously. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned that in your model, you actually um, can estimate a lot heavier disks, not just in gas, but also um, in, in dust. Um, so, and that's interesting because as you mentioned that there is sort of this, um, um, the thing about like the with the current protoplanetary disk measurement, there is a lot less uh, material as compared to what we observe with the exoplanetary systems. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, what time scale are we talking about? Because my guess is that, like, in your case, all of that mass is actually being drifted inwards, and that's why you lose that material. But like, maybe some of them actually coagulate into planets, and they obviously wouldn't show up in the protoplanetary disk measurements. But like, mm. what time scale are you talking about? And my guess is that this would also depend on the assumed size distribution of the grains. Yeah. So well, that's interesting. I'm sure it does depend a bit on the size distribution of the grains. But assuming that you're in some like growth limited, some, something where you have lots of mass and your heavy particles, it's about a million years before you enter this regime where you've lost most of your dust in the outer disk. Um, so plenty of time to form planets, I think, if you want to do that, um, depending on how planet formation works. But I feel like we're moving in, in uh, time scales where a million years would be enough times to form planets in the outer disk. Um, yeah, that's the rough time scale. Okay. Um, sounds like a lot of gas giants. Yeah, so I have, I'm working with someone in my group now about uh, what happens in Pebble accretion if you have all of your particle mass drifting past you. Um, and yeah, it's kind of hard not to form gas giants pretty readily in a lot of these systems. Yeah, we have very few gas giants. Yeah. Although I'm excited to see what happens when we can probe towards uh, cooler gas giants in direct imaging. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And once we, yeah, yeah. 
But I also think it's a problem, even if your discs aren't this massive and you believe pebble accretion as it currently stands, you're, you form a lot of planets. Yeah, but I think the question is like, uh, would, would you expect the current demographics, like small, a lot more small planets versus gas giants versus mm -hmm. like, because I can imagine like if you can form a lot of planets in the very beginning, it's really hard to, um, hard not to let them just all go. Um, at least like a lot more gas enveloped planets, if not gas giants. Yeah, I agree. There's also, so I, someone else, so uh, it just reminds me of work by Renata Frelick, uh, who's a grad student in my group. And she's done work where she starts off a planetary system with a whole bunch of gas giant planets and lets them evolve uh, dynamically. It's, it's a huge number of gas giant planets. I don't know if you would actually be able to form that under current models of planet formation. But if you do and you let them evolve, then they actually do look a lot like the giant planets we see. This is all in the inner disk if you put them in the inner disk. Mm -hmm. But they even match in terms of metallicity and some, some interesting things. So it could be the case you just form a lot and then things get really crazy. Okay, thanks. Daniel, it looks like you had another question um, along these lines. Yeah, I was just sort of following up there on um, if you have a gas giant that's already formed or you know is you know working its way up the mass chart, and you've got a bunch of pebbles drifting by, like how often are they going to end up on the planet? Yeah, so um, I should really look back at it, but uh, I think the answer is coming shortly. I think that they fairly, eventually you, so you can only, you uh, preferentially accrete certain planets, uh, certain pebbles. At some point you starve your core, it can't really, there's some interplay between what can be uh, assisted by gas drag onto your planet versus what's around you currently. Okay. But I, just thinking about it off the top of my head, I feel like things that are drifting should be easily incorporated into your planet, so. I don't quite have the answer for you yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Nick, it looks like you had another question. Yeah, so about your, um, your massive disks that are kind of like 10% or dozens of percent the mass of the, the star. I remember, I don't remember who it was, but there was some point maybe 10 years ago where people were looking at like short period planets and basically came up with some revised something like the minimal mass solar nebula, but not biased towards the solar system, but based on exoplanets. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, I don't know, I, I presume you need more mass to explain all the short period planets. Um, and so is your number like kind of a similar factor bigger than the minimum mass solar nebula? Yeah, good question. So that, I think that was Eugene worked on that minimum mass extrasolar nebula. I think it was a factor of three bigger or so not quite an order of magnitude. So I'm a bit bigger than that. I'm closer to order of magnitude bigger for most of these systems. Um, yeah. All right, any more questions for Diana? Go oh, I once. guess last thing I should say on that is uh, this is my samples heavily biased towards the biggest massive brightest disks in the sky that we can observe at multiple wavelengths. So you can imagine that maybe there is no standard minimum mass extrasolar nebula. Um, maybe they vary significantly. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for maybe one last question before we hit the end of the hour, if there are any. So let us linger here for a few seconds while people think of any last questions. Okay, well, if not, um, thank you again for a great talk, Diana, and for spending thank the day you. with us. Um, and please join me in you know, um, sharing your appreciation for Diana's talk in the chat or with the Zoom reactions. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. <laughs>